Hello, everyone. I'm sure you guys already know me. Uh, for those of you who are online, um, if you've never met me before, I'm Yung Wei Lee, or you can call me Kelly as well. Um, I'm a PhD student here at Lancaster University, and I have just started my second year. Uh, the presentation today is based on my uh, first experiment, the uh, uh, experiment that I did last year in my first year. And um, oh, and my uh, supervisor is Aina. She's joining us online. She's not here today in person, and she deserves to be acknowledged because she's the one who guided me through this experiment. So uh, she's um, very important. And uh, <laughs> and uh, the topic for today is the variability of bilingual language control in a one L two language context. So um, before I have you. So before I start talking about the theory of my research, I would like you guys to kind of think about these questions. The first one is how many languages do you speak? I speak three languages and there are two languages I mainly speak in. One is uh, English and then the other one is Chinese. And the second question is how often do you switch between your languages? How often? And the last question is when you switch to your L1, which is your Dhamma language, your first language, do you think it's faster or slow? And the reason why I ask you this third question is because there's something in your brain that makes language switching faster or slower. Do you, you want to ask your, your, your audience? Maybe we can ask colleagues here. Um, in, in does anybody who would like to answer? We can, we, can, we, can even, we can take a little poll. We can ask, for example, if we switch it to the chat, people can actually write their answers there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I know almost every, like, I, I can confirm everybody is in the audience speaks more than one language, <laughs> but it's very really interesting about the which one do you think is slower? I mean, it would be interesting to hear before you do your present the actual data. Mm -hmm. How many? So what do people? Hold on, I'll miss another person here. So if you think, for example, the third question, which one do you think is slower? Switching from a one to L two, or L two L one. So what do you guys think? If you had to write it, maybe we can just all write it. You want to switch, for example, to chat there. Mm -hmm. So if you switch the, the, the view to chat, then you can actually see the response. So I'll, I'll write, Saroosh just said, switching from L2 to 1 is slower. So let me think about my response. Hmm, expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is slower. I know. <laughs> I know. I really know the theory, so. Well, but it's so... Okay. No idea. <laughs> so, but you'll know in about half an hour. <laughs> no, okay, let me think Summer as well. said L1 to L2. <laughs> so what did, she, what did you say? L1 to L2. So Summer says L1 to L2. Yeah. Is slower. Uh -huh. Cindy, what about you? I'm thinking, but it depends a lot on the context. Ah, good. Okay. Oh, yeah. True scientist. <laughs> it depends on context. <laughs> there you go. All of us are very impulsive here. So. <laughs> I have no idea what to answer, actually. It's uh, 1 to L2. It's difficult because I'm bilingual with 12, 12 ones. It's it's not... So for me, what is L1? Do you mean L2, uh, a foreign language, like a second language? Yeah, your Something second language, like a... the non-dominant language. Yeah, that's, so it's an interaction there, says Simon. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interaction, yes. Um, so is it it's more difficult for me, for example, to switch from English to Portuguese or German, or vice versa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think so. My answer is no idea. <laughs> right, no idea, but interested in finding out. Yes, that's the thing I'm gonna talk about later. <laughs> cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, how do I if you just, yeah, okay. So the reason why I asked you this question is that there is something in your brain that makes language switching slower or faster. And it's called, oh my gosh, oh, echo. Close the Cindy's Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, this thing is called inhibition or suppression. And if I tell you there's inhibition in your brain when you're switching between languages, and can you feel it? Maybe after today's presentation, you'll be able to feel it when you switch between your uh, languages. 
So um, the, the main theory of inhibition was proposed by David Green in 1998. And the foundation of this theory is that when you switch between your languages, there is inhibition. For example, if you can look at the two images down there, if you see a pencil and you're required to name this pencil in Chinese, uh, Tian Bi, then your English will be suppressed. And in the next second, when you see another object, which is an apple, and you're required to name this apple in English, which is apple. In this case, your L1, your dominant language, your first language would be suppressed. So it works both ways. Depends on what non-target language it is. If it's a target language, it will not be inhibited. But if it's a non-target language, it would be inhibited. So that's the foundation. And the next thing is that when you're switching between your languages, just imagine when you're speaking L2 right now, your L1 would be suppressed. So there is time when you have to overcome that suppression in order to activate your L1 again. Okay, so that time point when you um, overcome the suppression is called switch cost, and that's the consequence of suppression or inhibition. And normally, because L1 is your dominant language, it requires more suppression than L2, which means L1 switch cost would be larger than L2 switch cost. That means when you switch back to your um, first language, it becomes slower. So I remember someone said that switching from L2 to L1 is slower. You're, you're um, right, theoretically. You're right, theoretically. And that unbanked. Yeah, Sarush said that. Yeah, he said that. Good job, you get it. Well like, done. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that uneven level of switch cost, larger L1 switch cost, smaller L2 switch cost is called asymmetrical switch cost. And switch cost is a component, a very important component um, of how we measure the magnitude of inhibition, the inhibition of L1 and inhibition of L2. And there's another thing I would like to point out is that David Green said that language context can affect how bilingual speakers switch between the languages. Mm -hmm. So that later on, Groshan proposed um, a theory called language mode, or you can also call it language context, because in this experiment it's called uh, language context. So he categorized language context in two different modes. One is bilingual mode, and then the other one is monolingual mode. And monolingual mode is um, where you mostly speak in this language and bilingual mode refers to both languages are probably the equally spoken. So because language context is very important and I would like to investigate how bilingual speakers switch between languages and what's the magnitude of inhibition in terms of different language context, one of my research question is how does inhibition differ in each language context? Okay, so um, we've got 61 Chinese English bilinguals who are currently living in the UK. 55, uh, 25 fish of them were from China and then the rest of them were from Taiwan. And um, all of them have completed this English language proficiency test called English Legs Tale. Uh, it only takes you five minutes. Uh, to decide whether this is a real word in English or whether this is a non-word in English. Um, it's not a long, thorough proficiency test, but it actually gives you a big picture of how proficient your bilingual speakers are. And um, in the end, when they complete the experiment, they get a five pound Amazon voucher. And uh, there's something I would like to point out is before I start recruiting my participants, I did um, a power analysis. Um, it's a sample size calculation. Um, there are a lot of ways you can calculate your, your sample size before you actually recruit your participants. And I did it in R. There's a package called Superpower. <laughs> <laughs> it's something called Superpower, and it's, it's quite interesting. And there's another software called G Power. You can also calculate your sample size there, but that's, I use Superpower. It's like I get the superpower to recruit participants. And um, if you're interested in this method, you can read this paper that I've just cited there. It's like last, last year, these people are very, they're, they're brilliant. They talk about how you calculate your um, sample size. 
And for for materials, I selected 300 pictures uh, from this picture database called MultiPic. Um, I got 150 critical pictures and 150 fillers. And the only reason why I selected 150 fillers is to create, to manipulate a monolingual context. For example, in an L1 context, all of the fillers would be named in L1. And in L2 language context, all the fillers would have to be named in their L2. In a mixed language context or bilingual language context, they will name half of the fillers in L1 and half of the fillers in L2. However, all of the fillers were excluded from analysis because we don't actually care about the fillers. We only care about how we manipulate the context. So for critical pictures, I, uh, I match each picture based on their name agreement, their word frequency, number of syllables, number of phonemes. Each component has to be, the p-value has to be above 0.1 in order to make sure that there's no significant difference between the, the pictures, that every picture is familiar to um, our participants. And there are three blocks in this experiment. One is called L1 predominant or L1 monolingual context. L2 predominant, L2 monolingual context. And then the third one is a, it's a bilingual context, but in this experiment, I call it mixed language context. So this is the, uh, an example of the procedure of the experiment. So it starts from a uh, 200 milliseconds fixation cross and then move on to the next critical trial. So in this experiment, I use faces of celebrities. So when you see Tom Cruise, you'll have to name that picture below. Um, in English. And when you see Jackie Chen, it's pretty obvious it's Jackie Chen. When you see Jackie Chen, you have to name the picture in Chinese. So uh, the, the picture would only be presented within 100, uh, 1,500 milliseconds and it disappeared. But the participants had until three seconds to respond to the picture. So everything goes really fast. And I got 600 trials in this experiment. So a lot of them got tired in the end. But, but yeah, that's that's how we measure reaction times and, and switch costs in this experiment. So yeah, and I did something different is that I used the faces of celebrities. In previous research, um, they use circles, different kinds of shapes or colors to indicate a language. But here in this experiment, because in reality, you switch languages because when you see this person, when this person doesn't understand your language, you switch to another language. So that's why I use the uh, faces of celebrities. Plus they're, they're famous. So then you would know that oh, I have to use English or I have to speak. So, it's, sorry. Yeah. so do you have some pretest about whether they know this picture? Um, no, 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 no. So I just select. Do you mean the, the pictures of celebrities? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I think maybe some participants do not know the pictures. Or who that's that's the reason I chose Tom Cruise, because uh, Tom Cruise is very, very famous. <laughs> very famous. Oh. Yeah, and well, in, in this generation, everyone knows Tom Cruise, I guess. <laughs> and, and in Chinese culture, I guess everyone knows Jackie Chan as well. Um, so, yeah. so the, but the instructions, you also don't explain. So, for example, if you see the picture of Tom yes, Cruise, yes, this is a prompt. Yes. Please repeat next yes. question. It's just a prompt. Yeah, yes. And then, so in terms of procedures, so you have 250 milliseconds of fixation cross. Then you see the image of Tom Cruise. And then you have, what is the 1,500 milliseconds there again? It, it just, the picture just disappeared and the, there's only a blank. It can still respond. Through the microphone. So you, you display the you you how long does it how long do you display the Tom Cruise image for? For fifteen hundred milliseconds. And underneath you see the the picture as well. So it appears picture. at the same time. Oh, yeah. appear in the same yeah. Okay. Appear at the same time. Oh, there are studies they use different they they show language cue first and then and then yeah, yeah. the stimulus or the other way around. But here I present them at the at the same time. Why did you do that? Why did you not do the, the opposite? Because then you, the participants wouldn't have any time to prepare for the language. So that when you're preparing the language, both languages would be um, activated at the same time. Mm. So then there would be another type of magnitude of inhibition. So in, in, this, in this experiment, we started from 
um, a, a relatively basic, like when you see the pictures at the same time, how would you react to that picture? And in the future, maybe we could manipulate a little bit, probably put Tom Cruise first and then the picture the next. And that's another uh, language lexical selection uh, mechanism that we can investigate through. But I mean, for you, it's only interesting. You, the, the, the function of this is just to, to say, okay, say it in English or in Chinese, right? As long as it does the trick. Yeah. As long as it doesn't distract or anything. Okay, so then you see the 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 the, the image for fifteen milliseconds. Then the does then a prompt appear, the microphone or yeah, that's it. So the the microphone appears, yeah. and then you have fifteen milliseconds to respond. Yes. The recording stops, then you have a blank, and then the, the next trial comes. Yes. So in order to collect my data, I ran my experiment on Gorilla. <laughs> um, it saves everything online, unfortunately. It doesn't detect the real speech onset time, the real reaction time of each participant when they name each picture. So that's the that's a problem. So I downloaded all the audio files and then upload them onto this tool called ChromeSet. It automatically detects <laughs> It automatically detects the reaction time for you, but um, in order just to make sure that Chromeset is is accurate, I extracted five percent of the audio files from each participant and then manually measured the reaction times by myself, and uh, I randomly um, randomly extracted the the audio files and the tool that helped me randomly extract the files is R. I found a script that you can randomly extract uh, audio files or any kinds of files from each uh, participant in each file. So R helped me a lot. And after I got the reaction times from Chromeset and the reaction times I manually measured by myself, I ran a Pearson's correlation test mm -hmm. and the results show that they're highly correlated. And thank God if they're not <laughs> correlated, then it's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just a nightmare. And for my main data analysis, um, I used uh, linear mixed models, and I will be using linear mixed models in the future experiments as well. And for ggplot, ggplot is your best friend. It generates nice pictures and nice plots for your, uh, your, your results. So in the end, there were 12 participants who got excluded. Um, if their reaction times are below 100 mil 150 milliseconds, that's too fast, so they're excluded. Or if they're above um, 300 milliseconds, 3,000 milliseconds, they're excluded as well. And for reaction times that are below or above 2.5 standard deviation, they're also excluded as well. So in the end, there were two partic 12 participants who got excluded. Which, which is such a waste. It's 60 pounds. It should, so, it, yeah, it should then it. exclude the entire participant or just the trials? Because often... Um, we excluded the, the participants and excluded some of the trials that they didn't perform actually really well. Like some of the mm -hmm. pictures that they were not able to name in some of the languages. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's a, such a waste. It's 60 pound Amazon voucher. So... Uh, and in terms of, remember I said something about language, English Lextail, uh, the average score is 68%, which means they're relatively proficient. They're not highly advanced bilingual speakers. They're relatively proficient in English. So before I get into the reaction times of each language context, I would like you to just look at the, the overall reaction times of each language in each uh, language context. And um, as this experiment doesn't focus on accuracy rate that much, because that's not how we measure reaction times or uh, switch cost. But um, I would like you to look at accuracy rate a little bit and then move on to the, the, the overall mean reaction times. So for participants, they, of course, they perform better in their Chinese than in their English. But if you, if you look at the the, the, the red square on the left, if you look at Chinese, uh, the reaction times are slower than English overall, the reaction times, which, which is interesting because it's your dominant language. However, when you're switching between languages, your dominant language becomes slower than your non-dominant language. 
Is someone out there? No, okay. And from starting from this slide, I will be presenting you the reaction times of each language context. So um, this table shows you the effects of language, the effects of switch and the interaction. Interaction is very important because that's how you know um, how do bilingual speakers switch between the languages, whether they switch to the L1 is faster or they switch to the L2 is faster. So first of all, there is no significant effect of language. And from switch and non-switch, non-switch means if it refers to when you name a consecutive set of pictures just in one language instead of switching between languages for the trials. So we found um, an effect of switching. And uh, most importantly, we found significant interaction of both languages switching. That means participants switch to one of the languages slower than the other. And that means it's asymmetrical switch cost. And here in this, uh, in this plot generated by ggplot, let's look at the non-switch trial first, the darker colors. Non-switch trial, when you're not required to switch, when you're required, when you're only required to name the trials in just one language, there's no significant difference between L1 non-switch and L2 non-switch. Chinese and English not. Chinese is not faster. It's not slower. There's no significant difference between the Chinese non-switch trials and English non-switch trials. So that's something we could think about. And the next one is that when they switch to the Chinese, Chinese switch trials are slower than English switch trials. And in order to see whether there is switch cost of that language, you look at the non-switch trial and switch trial of that language. If there's a significant difference between non-switch trials and switch trials of that language, then that means there's switched, there's switch cost. And in this case, based on the significant interaction we found, that uh, we could say bilingual speakers switch to their L1 slower than to their uh, L2 in an L1 language context. And this is the, the table. Uh, I generate, I converted this table into that plot, so that's easier for you guys to look at. But um, if you're still interested in numbers, as I've already said, uh, for Chinese non-switch and English non-switch, there's no significant difference. But Chinese non-switch and Chinese switch, there is significant difference since we found switch cost. And for English non-switch as well, English non-switch and English switch, we found switch cost, English switch cost. And for Chinese switch and English switch, we found that Chinese switch trials were slower than English switch trials. So there's a significant difference. And so this is the, the, the second one, which is the L2 predominant context or L2 monolingual context. We found a language effect, we found a switch effect. However, there's no significant interaction between language and switch. So I can just remind us, so, so when you say L1 predominant and L2 predominant, what do you mean? That means when they use this language majorly in that language context. Now how did you control that? I think you mentioned that, but with with you? fillers, with fillers. Ah, okay, okay. With fillers, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. So that means in this case, the Chinese English bilinguals, right? All of them. Yes. Right. So that means the L two predominant would be the English. Yes. Yes. So it'd be English. Yes. Yes. So in L two predominant, um, there's no significant interaction. That means it's symmetrical switch cost. That means when bilingual speakers switch that they took pretty much the same time switching to their L1 and to their L2 as well. There's no significant difference. And if we take a closer look at the plot, um, something interesting, there is a significant difference between Chinese non-switch trials and English non-switch trials. That means when you're not required to switch between languages, your Chinese, the reaction of your Chi reaction times of your Chinese got slower as so that when you're when you're naming pictures in non-swiss trials your reaction times of chinese were a lot slower than your english especially in an l2 predominant context and for um 
uh, Chinese Swiss trials and English Swiss trials, there is also a significant difference between them. And we also found switch costs as well. However, even though the switch trials here for Chinese and English are they're significant, we still we still who's okay. We still don't find any um, significant interaction. So when there's no significant interaction, you cannot say, oh, they switch to L1 faster or they when they or they switch to L1 slower. They we, the only thing we can say right here is that they switch to L1 and L2 pretty much the same time. Okay. So the switch cost and the inhibition, the magnitude of inhibition is pretty much the same. They're pretty much on the same level. And again, this is the the, the table um, calculated through linear mixed models. Uh, as you can see, different from L1 predominant, they they're all significant difference. Uh, Chinese non-switch and English non-switch and Chinese non-switch and switch, where it shows all the uh, Chinese switch costs. And English non-switch and switch, English switch costs. And for Chinese switch and English switch, of course, it's uh, it's it's significant. The difference is significant, but there's no interaction. If there's no interaction, you cannot say uh, L1 switch costs are larger than L2 switch costs. And finally, the mixed language context, it's, you can also call it bilingual context where O1 and O2 are used uh, equally the same. So we found language effect, we found a switch effect, but again, there is no significant uh, interaction for language for between language and switching. So in this case, we, we would still say that bilingual speakers took pretty much the same time switching to their O1 and switching to their O2. And if you look at the non-switch trials, there's no significant difference. However, L1 is just a little bit slower, but there's no significant difference. And in terms of um, in Chinese switch trials and English switch trials, there is a significant difference. And there are L1 switch costs and there are two switch costs as well. But since um, there's no in significant interaction, then this, in this case, in um, a mixed language context, we can say we can only say that it's symmetrical switch cost. Bilingual um, speakers took pretty much the same time, switching to their one, switching to their two. And again, this these are the numbers. There's no significant difference in Chinese non-switch and English non-switch. And there are switch costs for Chinese and for English as well. And, uh, Chinese switch trials are a bit slower than English switch trials, but there's no interaction. So then in this case, uh, uh, there is only symmetrical switch cost in the mixed language context. So um, I've listed out something for you. In L1 predominant context, we found asymmetrical switch cost, uh, there are there's no asymmetrical switch cost in both L1 predominant context and mixed language context. And there's something I have not mentioned to you before is that in inhibition, there is global inhibition and local inhibition. Global, global inhibition refers to when this language is slower than the other language, doesn't matter if it's switch cost or non-switch trials, if it's if it's slower than the other language, then that means this language is globally inhibited. But for um, local inhibition, it refers to when some when this language is inhibited based on the switch trials. So that we we saw there were uh, L1 switch switch costs and L2 switch costs, right? So that means L1 and L2 are locally inhibited. But for L1 it's globally inhibited. Remember, we saw there were um, uh, slower reaction times for L1 non-switch trials. So that means it's global inhibition. And remember that first table I showed you. If you take a look at this, L1, this is, this is clearer for you guys to, to understand a little bit more. So um, for L1, your Chinese is always slower in in across all the language contexts. And your English, it, 
for the, the reaction times of English, it, did, it didn't change that much. But the only thing that fluctuated was your L1, your dominant language. And even in your L1 predominant context, your L1 is still slower than L2, uh, which is very interesting because an L1 is your dominant language. And in L1 predominant context, your L1 is mostly spoken. However, when, when it comes to reaction times, your L1 is not faster. It's always slower than L2. So in terms of, um, uh, this is what I've just said before, L1 is innovated globally because when you look at the plot, L1 is always slower than L2. And especially in L2 context, in an L2 context, and when you're in L2 language context, you're still required to switch a little bit in between. And when you're required to switch, or when you're not required to switch, it doesn't matter, your L1 is always the slowest. And in terms of what David Green said for inhibitory control model, remember he said L1 switch cost would always be larger than L2 switch cost. That partially, that, that was partially right, but in our L2 language context and mixed language context, we found the similar pattern of um, L1 and L2 switch cost. And finally, another thing that Groshan pointed out um, in his theory of um, language mode, he said that L1 and L2 language context would modulate the activation of your L1 and L2. For example, your L1 in L1 predominant context, your L1 would be highly activated. But when you're in L2 predominant context, your L2 will be um, highly activated. But based on the the bar graphs we, we saw, the one that fluctuated a lot more was your L1 instead of your L2. So in this case, we should we would say that language context doesn't modulate your non-dominant language that much. It actually modulates the, the activation level of your dominant language a lot more than your non-dominant language. Okay. So um yeah, these are the references and thank you guys for listening. <laughs>